Welcome back to Spank Ranch Garage. I've had a lot of viewer requests to know a little bit more about my homemade dyno setup here. So let me show you how this thing works and what it can do. So this dyno is made by a company called Mustang and it was produced for emissions purposes. At least here in Pennsylvania, we used to put our OBD2 cars on a dyno and use a tailpipe sniffer to measure the emissions, yada yada. So anyway, this is a dual roller dyno. It's belt driven to a flywheel. It's got an eddy brake on the back of the flywheel. And then additionally, it's got a three phase motor on it for doing like speedometer calibration, things like that. I don't actually use that in the performance uh, aspect of things here, but it does work and I have used it for a couple of, you know, little things. First thing everyone asks is what do I have to do to make this a performance dyno? Well, it's never gonna be a performance dyno. Um, you know, this thing, I've made some modifications to this and it's good for about 400 horsepower on a turbo car. Anything more than that, there's simply not enough inertia and not enough eddy brake here to do anything reliably or collect enough data on a pole. So uh, this does work good for all those lower power cars that I do tune though. Let's go over some of the main functionalities. So while the dyno as a mechanical piece really doesn't do anything for measuring power or tuning, all of that falls in the data acquisition system here. So this is one of the original control boxes for the dyno. This was made by ESP, Environmental System Products. Uh, they're the ones who purchased the Mustang dyno and rebranded as their own. And inside here, I've retrofitted a little Lenovo computer. So this is a full desktop computer. I've got a Chinese um, 240 volt to basically 240 volt pulse width modulated thigh wrister. I forget, I, I built this thing so long ago, I don't even remember. But basically this is what powers my eddy brake. It allows me to control the torque based on a zero to five volt signal coming from my data acquisition. And then probably the most important part here is the Your Dyno box. So yourdyno.com. These are really good units. You can basically think of it as a standalone ECU for your dyno. So you could run this on, I could run this on any dyno, a mainline, a Dynacom, you know, whoever, as long as I've got a crank sensor signal or as long as I've got a roller speed signal and I know the inertia of the dyno, this thing will work for you and it does everything you need um, really nicely. Otherwise, this is an old school VFD. This is for running that motor we saw on the back of the dyno. Totally um, obsolete at this point. I mean, the thing's freaking huge. I don't use it for anything. So essentially the way this works is when I need to tune a car, I will take this out of the garage, bring it outside. The dyno always stays outside. Yeah, it gets fluttered under snow and water and everything else. I know it makes people very uncomfortable. This is out here getting wet. The only thing I can reassure you is the bearings and all the parts that matter do stay above water level. I've got a little trench here that drains this dyno pit out. I roll the computer out and then I've got three connections to make to the dyno. This large one here being the eddy brake control wires. These are the high current wires for that. I've got um, roller speed signal and then I've got my load cell here for when I'm doing uh, eddy brake torque based tuning. Startup procedure, throw the disconnect. Fire the computer up, and then we will turn on the TV. And this is gonna boot up to just a normal Windows 10 computer. Um, I do have external Wi-Fi booster here, so I can talk to the Wi-Fi at the house. I've got an MSD external TAC pickup here for doing like uh, cars with distributors, things that aren't fuel injected. And then I've also got a wideband hooked up to this as well, though it is not actually in the picture here because it's, Oh, it's on some customer's car, but anyway. So I got this wireless keyboard here, Logitech, pretty reliable. It's got a mouse built in. That way I can be sitting in the car operating the dyno while I'm also operating my computer. So then once you're into your Windows 10 side of this thing, you just open up your dyno just like any other program. Um, and it basically brings you to your first plot. Now I'll go ahead and say I'll open some runs. I've got in here just tons and tons and tons of customers' cars that I've tuned on this. Uh, what do we want to start with? We'll start with a we'll start with a 1.8T GLI. Actually, this had some pretty bad traces, if I remember correctly. 
So anyway, this is tuning through a, uh, a turned up 1.8 GLI. I've got six or seven runs here. Uh, the dyno software is pretty easy to manipulate. Um, you know, turn off the runs you don't want, whatever. You can change the colors on them all. Um, the cool thing is this, your dyno box does have a built-in weather station. So it's recording the temperature of the time of the runs, the humidity and the atmospheric pressure. It uses that to do the SAE correction or whatever correction you want. You can turn that on and off. People love to cry about corrections. Go ahead, keep crying. Um, so anyway, pretty easy to manipulate here. You can highlight, zoom in, you know, move the scales, whatever you want. You could do your results versus RPM, versus time, versus wheel speed, pretty much anything. Um, options wise, you know, this is a pretty configurable dyno setup. Uh, so I typically run this as an inertia dyno, but then when I'm doing part throttle tuning, I will use the eddy brake. I will switch this back to a load cell dyno, um, meaning it's going to engage the eddy brake, and then I'm going to be watching the reaction force on the load cell to see as I'm adding and decreasing timing how the car is responding to it. Plenty of videos on probably how to do that, so we won't get into that. Um, this thing can talk directly to OBD2. What kinds of stuff here? It's got auxiliary channels. This is where I have my wideband oxygen sensor hooked into. Um, you've got different brake control strategies, different units. Um, you know, you can make your own dyno printout sheet, all kinds of crap. This is a typical dyno printout from the Your Dyno. You can add your Spanko jet label up top. You can add, uh, you know, shop information, whatever. The plot is as you configure it lots of options with that you can even add another access below to show like um, a boost curve or wideband oxygen sensor and then at the bottom you have all your standard stuff your weather information any notes the tuner made etc so here on the actual dyno screen you know you got engine rpm torque and power and then brake percentage here is how much uh percentage i'm giving to the eddy brake now this eddy brake really is not powerful i mean it probably absorbs 150 horsepower maybe, and that's for short durations. It'll get hot if you hold it like that. But what you'll realize is, yeah, I'm not doing pulls against the Yeti brake. For around town tuning, you know, it takes 40, 50 horsepower to drive your car to work every day. So I can actually get a really, really nice drivable street tune using this little Yeti brake. And then these right here, they say roller and hub RPMs. Those are misleading. That's actually going to be engine RPM when I'm using the external tachometer pickup. And then I've got my speed uh, displayed here as well. So most of the time when I'm using this dyno, I will just lock in uh, my RPM based on what I see on the computer I'm tuning. So I'll put the car in fourth gear, hold it at 2000 RPMs, enter that here, lock the gear ratio, and we're going to pull our RPM from the roller. This is a fine practice, assuming you don't get wheel spin. Uh, when I do get wheel spin, I'll either fix the wheel spin issue or I will also hook up the secondary RPM input so I can see engine RPM versus roller speed and I can see if we've got a clutch slipping or a tire slipping or whatever. So as for mechanical modifications for this dyno to make it work in a performance application in which it was never intended, the first thing I had to do was change the gear ratio of the flywheel. So in factory form, we had these large pulleys down here, and we had a very small pulley up here, meaning that you'd get a lot of flywheel speed per roller speed. And I think this dyno was only rated to like 60 or 80 miles per hour from the factory. That's no good on a car that I need to put some more load on. I want to run in fourth or fifth gear. So what I did was I re-geared this to make it a one-on-one -on -one, uh, gear ratio. So I forget all the math. This has been so long since I built this, but I think I think at 150 miles an hour, I'm now at the factory rated flywheel speed of 60. So uh, while it seems like I'm, you know, really abusing the dyno, really I'm not spinning the flywheel anywhere faster than it's designed uh, RPM. And I'm sure it could handle a lot more, but that's not something you really want to play with. Um, speaking of that, placement of this dyno, you know, if you're putting this in your backyard, you need to realize that when something's going to let loose and explode, it's going to go this direction or this direction. So I, I made it so it doesn't hit my house, it doesn't hit my neighbor's house, it just flies into the, you know, into the abyss if something were to launch, God forbid. Now, on the actual belt system here, this is rusty from sitting, but all this cleans up after a couple pulls. Uh, you got this tensioner belt here. If I remember right, I did build a custom tensioner for this. I extended it and I did some things to make it work with this pulley. 
And also I had some stiffness issues with this. So on a real high torque hit on a V8, you will actually flex this tensioner back a little and you'll get some belt skip. Um, so that's why I welded this nut on here. I was gonna build a support downwards to support this, but honestly it hasn't been rearing its head lately, so it's not much of an issue. Closer look at the flywheel here. Nice heavy piece of metal. Um, and you'll see this is all on Dodge bearings. I mean, these are good rebuildable bearings. They're all serviceable and greasable. Maybe I grease them once a year. Here's your little Eddie brake here. Um, this is a good brake. I don't use it for long durations because she will get hot. So you have to be mindful of that. Here's the load cell here. I bought this from your dyno. Uh, so it came with it. So this pretty much this whole eddy brake frame is floating on the center axle and then you've got a load cell constraining it. So when the eddy brake is braking, you're reacting against the load cell. You're measuring that directly as torque and it is actually a 12 inch lever. So it is literally foot pound. So every, every pound down here is one foot pound of torque. Very easy to calibrate. You can just stack weights right on the corner here. Uh, really easy to set up. <clears throat> And then for RPM pickup on the dyno, this is literally a BMW M50 oil pump sprocket. Put it on the lathe, knock the teeth down a little bit on it, and then set up a crank sensor to it. Then that measures your roller speed. Other than that, there's not a lot to this dyno. There is a, um, an airbag system in here in the crotch of this thing. There's a couple airbags and they lift up this plate and that makes it easier to get cars on and off the dyno. I never did that. I never bothered setting that up because I just don't care. Um, I just pop the clutch and pop right out of there when I need to. And then for strapping cars down, I dug holes in the ground, 24 inches down, put concrete, rebar, and hooks that I welded together. And this is where I tie the rears of the car down. I actually had front tie downs up on my pad here but then a snow plowing incident um, blew them right off. So you can tell there was one mounted here. See you later. So uh, right now I just strap it to the skid steer or whatever. I tune cars so infrequently these days, I'm not really motivated to fix any of this correctly. So I'm just kicking the wheel over right now. Based on the inertial change of this, it's reading torque and, and speed and yada, yada, yada. So as for acquiring one of these, if you're in a state that used to do OBD1 emissions, these are on their way out. Honestly, they're probably already scrapped. Uh, I bought this one for the price of scrap. I had a deal worked out to buy another one for the price of scrap. I never followed up on. I was going to have a spare. Um, but, you know, even if you end up paying 500 bucks for this, you couldn't build all this for 500 bucks. Just shafts, rollers, and bearings, no chance. So they're worth some money. Now, setting up the actual computer and data acquisition side is a little more expensive. Uh, the Your Dyno, I, I think that's probably 1200 bucks or so. You, know, you got to buy a PC, monitor, you don't have to buy an Eddie brake controller, but I wanted to use it. Um, you know, all in all, I'm probably 2000 bucks into this dyno with, you know, buying the pulley, the new belt, yada, yada, yada. But I have a lot of time and tinkering into this. Um, it pays for itself very quickly. I mean, a couple tunes, this thing's paid off. It's been paid off for a very long time. And I'm kind of getting out of the tuning thing, um, at least from a public standpoint. So I don't use this much anymore, but it is a great tool to have for me here at home because, you know, if I got a car that's not street legal and I want to troubleshoot a problem or do whatever, boom, just throw it on the dyno, make a couple pulls, figure out a drivability issue. I mean, I've even used this on carbureted vehicles to, you know, have somebody look under the hood and make sure that the secondaries are open and the four barrels are open and all that kind of stuff that would be kind of tough to do on the road you can just strap it down and do it in the safety of your backyards other considerations for this is um you know check with your local township uh make sure that it's you're allowed to have a dyno in your backyard some townships probably have a problem with that i've been pretty lucky i haven't had any uh issues with that kind of thing and also uh it is extremely loud i mean you're literally um, spooling cars up to rev line over and over again all day in your yard. So make sure your neighbors are cool with it. The thing I hear a lot is like, oh, it's not okay for this to be outside. It's not okay for it to get wet. Yeah, it's not ideal. But keep in mind, these bearings are greasable bearings. These bearings are in mining, mining equipment, conveyors, you know, air handlers. They are out in nature doing their thing 365, you know, every single year. So while, yeah, it's a little cringy to have your dyno outside, uh, there's absolutely no reason one can't get wet with a little bit of maintenance. Another big question I get is, how do you know your dyno is accurate? 
is it a dino jet or a mustang or what numbers does it read okay so it's actually pretty easy to calibrate a dyno when you have a load cell and an eddy brake and the procedure for this is first you calibrate your load cell your load cell is pretty easy to calibrate you can use free weights from the gym you stack 100 pounds on this plate you've got 100 pounds on the load cell you make sure the computer reads that right then the unique situation i'm in that most dynos are not is that i can spin this dyno up with this motor to 60 miles an hour. So I will set this thing up to 60 miles an hour, and then I will cut the motor, apply the eddy brake, and plot the force it takes to slow the dyno down. Then I know you, from there, and then from there I can calculate the inertia of the complete system. And because I didn't use a car to spin that up, or a go-kart, you know, I see guys online, they'll, they'll spin it up with a go-kart or whatever, and then put the clutch in whatever it's actually very accurate because this motor is always in the system right this is belted to the back roller all the time so i'm not changing the inertia at all you spin it up with the motor slow it down with the eddy brake observe your force through the load cell and you can calculate the exact inertia for this dyno but anyway that's how you calibrate one of these and you can fight that calibration strategy all you want you're not here to make numbers, you're here to see changes. And I can see the difference on a Miata just pulling the air filter out of a stock air box. I can repeatedly see that difference on this crappy dyno. So it's doing its job. You can fight all day about three horsepower on the big end and oh, this dyno's inaccurate or your dyno jet's inaccurate or this and that. It doesn't matter. If you actually use a dyno and know how to use it as a tool, none of this crap matters. And I hear, I get a lot of pushback about this when my dyno goes on Facebook and people get all butt hurt. It is what it is. The people that are butthurt are people that don't actually understand what one does and how it works. And they've probably never operated one or tuned a car on one. And while we're on the sloppy outdoor crap that I build, um, cooling your car while it's on the dyno is also important. This is a thing I built for free as well. This is a blower out of a household HVAC unit that I took some sheet metal and I built like a nozzle slash shroud for, right? And this, this thing's pretty high volume. And then when you accelerate it through this nozzle, it moves a lot of air. I don't have any heat problems on any of the cars that I tune. All right, guys, that's all I got for this one. Post your questions in the comments. I'm sure there'll be a bunch. Seems like people that don't own their own dyno hate on my dyno, and I expect that. So post that in the comments. I wanna hear all the problems with this. I wanna hear why it's unsafe. I wanna hear why it's inaccurate, why you can't tune a car on it. Let me know in the comments. Thanks for watching Spank Ranch Garage. See you next time.